Welcome to The Last of Us Live, presented by Access, powered by IGN, and lest we forget, hosted in association with Game. I'm Dan Ma, and hopefully to my right should be Holly Bennett. Yep, there she is. Holly, what have we got in store for the folks tonight? We have a fantastic event. We've got over 200 community members that have come together to try out the post-pandemic spectacular that is The Last of Us. Yes, over the next hour or so, we're going to have an exclusive live gameplay demo from Naughty Dog, who've flown all the way from California to be here. And then we'll have a live Q&A with the team and Ashley Johnson, who portrays Ellie in the game. But this isn't just a standard Q&A. It's one with a bit of a difference, isn't it? Yes, it is. All of the questions we're going to be asking are questions that you're going to give us. So we want you to tweet your questions to the Naughty Dog team via at PS Access or at IGN UK or via at Game Digital. But to have your question submitted, you have to use the hashtag, hashtag The Last of Us Live. Yeah, absolutely. And the best bit is, if you do get your question answered by the Naughty Dog team, you'll win a, a Last of Us, or The Last of Us, goodie bag. And that contains a very snazzy Mad Cat's headset. Now, sadly, this is open to UK only, and all the terms and conditions are on the IGM website. But for now, sit back and enjoy this little video clip that'll give you some idea of what to expect from today's event. Okay. Better than that guy. Search him. I'll take care of his buddy and then we quit this place. Ah, bingo. This is our routine. Day and night, all we do is survive. It never lets up. He tells me how these streets were crowded with people just going about their lives. <laughs> Must have been nice. I'm here with IGN's Keza McDonald, who had the fortune of playing The Last of Us demo yesterday at the press day. So, Keza, what have you seen of the game so far? Well, there's a couple of different demos like scattered around the halls here. And the thing that really stands out at you about them is they all have completely different pacing. Like, some of it feels like survival horror, some of it feels much more action-y, some of it's stealth. And honestly, the environments are all, they're all like destroyed and apocalyptic, but they're all very different. I mean, what I can't wait to find out is how this is going to play out over the course of the whole game, because if they can keep changing up the pacing like this, you know, it's it's going to be really unique, honestly. So, what was the first thing that really stood out for you when you when you first set hands on it? So, the title screen here is a, a pair of curtains in front of a window, and they're the best-looking pair of curtains I've ever seen in my life. In general, like the Last of Us looks. I mean, I personally have not seen anything on next gen that looks as good at this. As what we're seeing is Naughty Dog, who obviously have amazing mastery. If you just look at Uncharted, they've got amazing mastery of the PlayStation 3 hardware. And this is them absolutely at the top of their game with that hardware. It looks, it looks better than anything I've ever seen on this console. And honestly, it looks like one of the best looking things out there right now, even though we're on the cusp of the next console generation. It, it tends to be the way, doesn't it? With, uh, you know, as we come into the end of a cycle, 
obviously looking towards the PlayStation 4. I mean, suddenly all these new tricks start emerging from the PlayStation 3, don't they? So, I mean, do you think this kind of represents now the real, the kind of the pinnacle of what this console is capable of? I think, yeah. I think, you know, six, seven years ago when they were talking about the fact they were unlocking the potential of PS3, this is what you would hope would happen is you end up with something that's just astonishingly good looking. And it's, it's not even just the, uh, just the environments, just the, you know, the fact that it's got, it's got lots of graphics, as it were. It's just the fact that the acting is great and the performances are really good as well. So it, just, it all looks just, it looks so consistent and so good. It's really difficult not to get drawn in because of that, you know? It kind of shows you what good graphics do for a game, which yeah. just make it more real for you. And it's not, it's not just the graphics, it's also the animation and the uh, performance capture. And in this case, I think the acting and the Norseman themselves reckon that the performances in this game from the two leads is some of the best game acting they've seen ever. Would you, would you agree with that from what you've seen so far? Obviously, from what you've seen so far, yes. Yes, I would agree. It's heavy it's, caveat. Heavy caveat, but it is some of the best game acting I've ever seen. It's, it's excellent acting, full stop, you know I mean? Whereas the distinction between game acting and film acting is superb acting, especially Ellie's actress. I think we'll meet later, Ashley, but the, the, the dynamic between the two characters as well, you can tell that, I mean, I've heard from Naughty Dog that the game ended up changing based on the performances and based on what the characters were like and how the actors were interpreting those characters, and you can really see that dynamic come through in the game. I think that it really helps your storytelling if you have characters that look like people, you know? Yeah, it really absolutely. helps. You, you mentioned Ellie. Now, it's always been a bit of a, a bone of contention with games that you have an AI <laughs> accomplice, an escort character, something like that. I mean, how, how have they tackled it in this game? Does it, does it work? Well, that's generally with an escort character, right? You're usually looking at somebody who's either telling you what to do all the time or getting in the way all the time. And so far, Ellie has done neither of those things. And also, you're not always looking after her, or trying to keep her safe. You know, she can look after herself to a huge extent and she's she's like unique obviously we've had another like prominent companion character in, in another big game this year but um, Ellie feels different from that she, she, it's, it's a unique dynamic that you've got gameplay wise as well because she's not just um, you know magically invincible she doesn't just hide in the corner and then the enemies ignore her she actually feels like she's part of what's going on not like a, a device not not a kind of uh, this magically invincible girl who hides in the corner which is sometimes what you get I suppose the important thing is not to have someone that gets in trouble and you're like oh god I've got to go and save her again but rather some that when she's in danger you feel compelled to rescue her that's another thing about this actually there's a few scenarios in here where um, Joel's in huge danger and Ellie helps him out and there are other scenarios where because you play as Joel Ellie's in danger and you feel terrible you're like oh I've let you down and it's it's, it's a dynamic, again, I've not really experienced it to this extent in anything else. So there are games where you have a companion character that, that makes you feel connected, but not like this so far. I'm just wondering how it's going to play out over the course of the whole game. This is the longest campaign, I believe, that Naughty Dog has ever made. So, I mean, the Uncharted games, previously quite short games, and they're very high octane, and they sustain a really high quality throughout. But for a longer game, I mean, if it can sustain the quality too, that will be a real achievement. I think a lot of that's also down to the pacing of the game. Obviously with Uncharted, you've kind of got this blockbuster Indiana Jones action adventure type feel. So it really has to kind of rattle along where this seems to be a bit more kind of introspective and, 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 and quiet. It's a sad game. Yeah. I'm finding it sad. Playing it, it's, I mean, it's terrifying as well. I'm, I am, you know, for want of a better phrase, a massive girl when it comes to scary games. Uh, I find it very, um, it's very tense. And whenever anything's not happening, I'm just permanently terrified of what's about to happen. It's got that kind of constant tension. And you know, there's this omnipresent threat. And the fact is the, uh, the infected, uh, who are the, you know, the uh, zombie-like enemy characters, they're not always there. They're not always there at all. Like sometimes you're fighting them, some fight, sometimes you're fighting other survivors who are a bit smarter, but the thing is you always know they could be there. So you turn a corner and you think they might be there. And even if they're not, you're still frightened. It's, it's a clever trick of suspense. And, and how is it in terms of, of combat? From what I've played, there's, there's, there's a choice for the player between whether you take an offensive approach or a defensive approach, even to the fact that when you're crafting items, for example, uh, you can choose to use the same ingredients to make a Molotov cocktail or, or a health pack. That's right. Uh, I mean, uh, what, what style do you think you'll be favouring when, you, when you play through it? Defensive, <laughs> I think, probably because I need the health packs. It's, it's taking me quite a while to get used to the style of combat here because what you expect from a game, you know, guys start shooting at you, you're like, oh, I'll just crouch down here until he pops his head up. That doesn't happen. He just runs away, he runs around the corner, he just hides from you, or they remember where you are. Like The, the AI remembers where you last were. So they'll try and look for you there and they'll flank you there. So you have to really rethink how you approach combat because it's easy to get into that lazy video game rhythm. You know, like crouch here, you know, shoot heads when they pop up from behind bits of scenery. But it's a really different feel and stealth is really important. I'm not very good at it yet, but stealth is really, really important. Uh, I think trying to evade and distract is much more of a factor here than it has been in, well, obviously it's not even a factor in Uncharted, but it's, it's much more of a factor here than it has been in many other like adventure, action adventure games I've played. 
Great stuff. And, um, and finally, what, what are you going to be up to for the rest of the evening? This isn't the last we're going to see of you, is it? No. Um, we're doing a live gameplay demo with Naughty Dog, uh, which uh, I'll be trying not to talk over. And then after that, we're doing our live Q&A, which you will have heard about already. Uh, so yeah, we'll be reading out questions on stage for later to be answered by Naughty Dog themselves. Fantastic, Keza, thank you so much for your time. Right, now we're going to cut you over to the first of our three-part interview series. This time, the guys from Naughty Dog are going to talk about the characters of The Last of Us. Why would they mow down all these people? The cane laid everyone in. <laughs> so they killed them? And dead people don't get infected. It's kind of shitty. And the core of The Last of Us is really about the bond between Joel and Ellie. It can't be any worse than in here. Can it? And that's kind of what this game circles around in, in a lot of aspects, is the contrast. And Joel and Ellie are truly like the center of, of everything inside of this, this game. Definitely Joel and Ellie's friendship, relationship is something you would have in real life. A hound in the distance is starting to bay. And these are two survivors living in a world that has been decimated for 20 years by this pandemic. Joel is a survivor who, who's basically been filtered through or strained through this tragedy, which is the pandemic that hits and uh, decimates society. And any of the survivors who, who, who get through that kind of a tragedy or a situation are going to have a, a, a true transformation of character and who you are and where you draw your moral lines. Hey. There you are. Are you okay? Whereas Ellie, who's 14 years old, so all she knows is this world after this pandemic. Um, she's lived in this very isolated quarantine zone run by the military. She's seen people get executed for breaking laws, for stealing, for testing positive for infection. Um, so unlike someone like us, who would be horrified by seeing someone get killed or seeing some of these violent acts, she can kind of just brush them off because she sees them on a daily basis. The journey basically takes these two people and propels them into a situation kind of beyond their control and it's in circumstances that they didn't necessarily like ask for. Um, but these two contrasting characters wind up together and outside of the quarantine zone and this really opens up an opportunity to have these two characters play off each other. Whoa. This is fancy. You know, she's 14 in sort of this post-apocalyptic world, but she's not your average, not your average 14-year-old by any means. You ever stay at a place like this? I before, I don't want to shit, I mean. I mean, she's a little bit feisty, but also she's more of an adult than someone would be used to, you know, a 14-year-old in our world. Man. What? Nothing, it's just... I've never seen anything like this, that's all. You mean the woods? Yeah. Never walked in the woods. It's kind of cool. <laughs> in writing The Last of Us, it all started from this very high concept. Uh, Bruce, the game director, and I uh, both worked on Uncharted 2. Uh, and there was this bit in Uncharted 2 that was really inspirational to us for this game, is this bit where you're with Tenzin, the Sherpa uh, in uh, Nepal that saves Drake. Tenzin doesn't speak English and Nathan Drake has to kind of fumble his way through this as Tenzin walks through the, the village kind of showcasing almost like with pride of like you know this is this is his these, these are his people and this is his village and he's kind of like kind of the local village badass in a way is how we, we wrote him and we thought it was really interesting to create that dynamic of, of somebody who doesn't speak the language and, and Nathan Drake trying to fumble and you as the player controlling your way through that and kind of experiencing that. And for that sequence we really try to use gameplay and see how much of a bond, how much of a relationship we can build with gameplay over the, over the course of just a couple levels. Uh, and we felt we were pretty successful with it. And then this idea came to be, it was like, well, what if we took an entire game and based it around this concept? So at the beginning of the game, these two characters meet and they don't even like each other very much. And over the course of the entire game, you see this bond form and it's formed like slowly, a bit by bit at a time that by the end of it, um, you're seeing greater and greater sacrifices that these two characters are willing to do for one another. We want you to feel the changing of these characters and dynamically transform these characters over the course of, of this adventure. 
Now, one of the best parts about actually being here at the event is being able to get hands on with the game. So I've managed to gather a few people off the uh, off the show floor. I'm going to ask them a little bit about the game. Now, you guys are already getting stuck in. So, so far, what are you thinking of the game? Yeah, it's good. Uh, I do like the um, atmospheric idea of it. It's very uh, intense, like now, for example, not too good. Yeah, you're trying to talk and play at the same yeah. time. It's not, not easy for you. So, so far, you've been watching your friend play. Now, what are you thinking? Because obviously, you've got the outside view of this. Yeah, I think it's bloody brilliant. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like seeing everything that around you and like having to work with the environment and like sometimes the environment works against you and it's amazing. So any of you guys here played any other Naughty Dog games before? Anyone played Uncharted? What do you think of that? And what do you think about Naughty Dog as a studio as well? I think Naughty Dog is amazing. I love the Uncharted series. I got one, two and three. Um, this game, I like the fact that you have to be a bit more strategic rather than just run and gun. So anyone here already seen anything? Anyone seen any trailers? We've seen some stuff about the, the atmosphere of the game. Anyone seen like the survival part as well? Um, not particularly, but having just looked at this recently, uh, there were quite a few parts where uh, it seemed quite dynamic, the way the enemy reacted to things. Uh, so you're hiding behind a crate and you just had your head popping up and the enemy could still see you. It wasn't just, oh, you hide behind the crate, you're instantly hidden. And the way you can p interact with things in the environment just seems quite intuitive and interesting. Now, what are you guys thinking of the event? Can we have some more people who want to come in and join us and chat to us about what they thought so far? So you've been here and this place looks pretty spectacular, but do you want to just try and describe it to people at home? Uh, it's very much like a haunted house. I think you come in, there's smoke everywhere, there's lights flashing, uh, there's cabinets like um, where you get your sweets from and they've got ripped open doors, telephone booths laden about the place. I think it's really good. One of the best events I've been to that's really been well decorated. It's like you're actually there in The Last of Us, sort of. So what do you think then of The Last of Us from what you've seen so far? Now I've been trying to stay away from it a lot because <laughs> I want a lot of surprises for myself but I love what Uncharted, um, what Naughty Dog have done with Uncharted and obviously being the original creators of Crash Bandicoot, they've come a long way since then. But now they're on to games like this and The Last of Us and it's been one of the most anticipated titles of this generation. And now we're at the end of the PlayStation 3's life as it were, now with the PlayStation 4 coming up. I can't wait to see what they do with it next. Now, obviously, you guys sound like you play a lot of games, but one thing everyone always seems to worry about is like, sort of taking a female partner with you. Do they get in the way? Are they going to cause any trouble? From people who have been playing so far, what are you thinking of Ellie and how she's assisting you? You're already playing, so I'm going to ask you again. Yeah, she's, um, she's clever. She's a clever girl. Yeah, you don't expect her to be, but she does help you out quite a lot. Uh, the little things, like um, she'll sometimes uh, give you a little bit of direction or she'll pick up some things for you. It's, uh, yeah, it's good. It's a good way. So have any of you guys got any questions you'd love to ask Naughty Dog if you join us later on for the live q If you could ask them anything, what would you want to know about this game that we haven't quite shown you yet, that you just, you know, you have to know about The Last of Us? Anyone? I'd like to ask if they see this as a franchise, as a series of uh, more games to have in the future, whether it be with Joel and Ellie or another group of people in that world. You guys in the comments section here watching this, you know, let us know. Would, you know, do you want to see The Last of Us a franchise? Do you guys enjoy franchises? Do you like standalone IPs? Naughty Dog are here tonight and will be reading nearly everything you guys say. So it's kind of awesome that you guys get this opportunity. Now, anyone else? Anyone got it pre-ordered yet? Anyone kind of jumped in and got this game pre-ordered? Um, I've not got it pre-ordered yet, but having seen it today, I think it is something that I'm going to have to pick up on launch. Um, I like the way everything in the world is so subtly hidden. You can then... Just go over to it, see if you can use it. If you can't use it right away, put it in your backpack and then you know, bring it out when you can use it. Um, it's, it's, it's just great. It is looking really good straight out of, of something like Fallout, but third person and on the PlayStation 3. <laughs> Now, obviously, one thing everyone loves about video games is graphics, and we know we've got a new generation coming away, but what have you guys thought of what you've seen so far of The Last of Us as well? Anyone want to wager? Anyone want to come in and answer a few questions for me? Yeah, come on. Come on in right here. So tell me what you think so far, graphically, what you've seen of The Last of Us. Uh, I think it's very impressive. Like somebody mentioned before that Naughty Dog developed it, and uh, with Uncharted, the graphics were really great. Everyone seemed to beat The Last, and this one's beaten Uncharted, in my opinion. Just the way of the, uh, the backgrounds, the atmosphere, even the character models, really good. Now, you're also playing it now. You've probably started to notice, I imagine, that you don't have an awful lot in the way. You've just appeared upside down. An awful lot in the way of ammo. How is that affecting how you play? It's, it's, yeah, it's one of those things you have to kind of worry about because I don't know when a zombie's going to you know, appear and do I conserve my ammo? Do I keep it for some other encounter or do I use it and you know, save myself? It's, you know, I mean, you can try and get up close and sometimes that goes well for you, sometimes it doesn't. So what do you guys think? Have anyone heard? We've got the soundtrack playing in the background. I know it sounds pretty amazing. 
we've got obviously the soundtrack on the game. What are you thinking of the atmosphere from what you guys have heard as well? I mean, if anyone heard a clicker coming yet? Have you experienced a clicker coming after yeah. you? How does yeah. that make you feel? It's, it's a little bit unnerving. Uh, you don't expect them to click, but <laughs> they do. And uh, yeah, especially when they get up close to you. Just like they are right now. I'll leave you there then, guys. Anyway, thank you guys, everyone, for taking part. I know it's not very nice of me forcing you all to be on camera. But why don't you guys at home now, you can watch our latest trailer where Kes McDonald will be talking to the Naughty Dog team about how they came up with the idea and how they've grown from the Uncharted series. Naughty Dog, we're known for our character-driven games, for our stories, and that's always been approach. It's just with The Last of Us, we try to apply the same kind of principles, but to what we're saying is a survival action genre. Naughty Dog wants to give opportunities for uh, the amazing, talented people we have in the studio to give them opportunities to basically flex their muscles and kind of like show off their skills. So we wanted to create a second team. <laughs> The transition was really taking what Naughty Dog is known for in um, storytelling, character development, character action, and, and the marriage of gameplay and story, something I think that um, Uncharted really set the bar for, and, and um, we've all, as developers, learned a lot about that process. Transitioning between games, especially when you're going from one IP to another, is pretty strange. One is because you're coming off a horrendous crunch, uh, where everybody puts, pours their heart and soul into a game. Uh, and at the time, it was Uncharted 2 for us. We had crunched really hard. Um, we're really proud of what, what the final game that we put out there. Uh, and then it was time to start thinking about, well, we're going to do a new IP for Naughty Dog. And we came out of No Country for Old Men, and I remember stepping out. It was like stepping out of a, like a different world. I just I was in a different world inside of that theater, and it completely captivated me. And the tension in that movie, and it was palpable. And getting invested in the characters like Lou Allen Moss, and the reason why he's so subtle and so so perfectly written, and I I loved that character so much. And I knew that things were at stake because you also knew Antoine Chigurh as the enemy, and and what was up against Lou Allen Moss. And when you see this relentless threat coming after him, the tension that got created, and the stakes are so high, and we came out of that theater going like, I've never played a video game like that. Like, what if you could play that? Like, what would you, I, I want to play that game. <laughs> we wanted to have an investment in the characters and an investment in the world. We wanted to create a grounded reality that you could truly um, believe in these characters and believe in, that the stakes are high and have that same sort of tension, that palpable tension that came out of No Country for Old Men or, or uh, City of Thieves, the novel, or The Road, the novel, and, and, and feel like I want these characters to survive. And the interactive medium video games truly gives us that affordance because as the player, we don't propel the story without our participation. And that participation comes with the actions of like trying to survive scavenging the environment for supplies and like not knowing like Joel knows like around the next corner there could be anything death could lie at, at, around the next corner at any turn something's going to happen what the fuck no. ah. oh shit he's got a gun he's got a gun when it all comes together is pretty late in the process. Uh, I remember when we first were about to put the demo out with the Infected, um, and two weeks before that demo, it wasn't fun. And it's, it's, it's incredible how late in the process it all, it all has to come together. Like for a long time, like you know, the, you're going for this certain emotional beat, and that beat is not there. Uh, or you're going for a certain flow, and that flow is not there. And it's only once music and gameplay and the controllers are tweaked and the voice acting for a long time we used temp voice acting for us, uh, people around the studio and it's just it's comical because none of it really works uh, and then you get you know the actors to 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 give it that that authentic uh, uh, take on the characters um, and then the AI 
Uh, you know, we finally ironed out uh, all the bugs out of it. And then it all like, it worked. And you get in this flow um, and you feel the, the, the relationship between Joel and Ellie and you're going from moment to moment. Uh, and it's just like, holy crap, it all came together. Uh, and, but it always comes together in the last second. And it's been like that on every project we've done at Naughty Dog. Now, this is your reminder that we still have the live Q&A coming up, but there's still plenty of time for you to tweet your questions for Naughty Dog and Ashley Johnson to either at PS Access, at IGN UK, or at Game Digital. Just don't forget to include that vital hashtag, The Last of Us Live. Yes, we are now seconds away, so why don't you guys sit back, relax, check out our third and final video as we chat to Naughty Dog team about the upcoming demo and what you'll be seeing. We really wanted to show this part of the game because this is where we started. This is the first area of the game we worked on. Um, this is the first cinematic we shot with uh, Troy and Ashley. Uh, and we really feel it captures um, the flavor of the game. Now what? Screw it. Well, what's fun about the demo you're about to see is it shows, it, it, one, of the, one of the big things that we want to get into is the different ways that humans survive in this world after society collapses, after supplies have run short, and like, what are the moral lines that different factions of humanity, um, what do they cross? Where do they draw those lines to create a, a, an existence for themselves? So the demo we're about to show is um, the bit where Joel and Ellie, you know, they've been together for a few days now, um, they've managed to get a, 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 a truck. They're trying to get to the west part of the country, western side of the country. Uh, and they're driving, unknowingly, they're driving into a city, Pittsburgh, that has been turned into a giant trap. They basically have created a, a spider's web, so to speak, uh, laid traps at different intersections and, and uh, thoroughfares entering the city. So anybody that has to cross through Pittsburgh is uh, un unknowingly going to be snared by one of these traps. And Joel and Ellie, who have procured a, a vehicle from an earlier adventure, they're making their way across. And Joel has a um, suspicious feeling when he sees that the freeway is blocked off. And these are the kind of people that behave very much in the way that Joel used to behave before he ran into Ellie. So he sees this coming. He sees the trap. It's a little too late. The ambush happens. Uh, but now you're going to see how um, Joel survives under a, a situation like this and how Ellie can help him. You get to see like what happens to society after everything breaks down. And throughout Pittsburgh, you're going to get to see and explore more and more of what kind of lengths these people have gone to and kind of the darkness that they exist in. But also understand from Joel's perspective as kind of a somebody who's shut down emotionally himself and has to go on, cross his own sort of what used to be moral lines, um, he can kind of relate to them and he understands and he almost lays it out that it's like there's no real good or bad and they're, they've made the choices they have to make in order to survive and later on you're going to meet other factions and see like different perspectives that they bring to the journey. What about the guy? He ain't even hurt. <laughs> But we really feel like this area, this city, um, has kind of, it's more like what we call the fun and games of The Last of Us, if, if, if you could call it that. Um, where you really see Joel and Ellie starting to bond, starting to come together and having to do what they need to do to survive in this world. Well, it's the main event. This is our live gameplay demo of The Last of Us with Bruce and Neil from Naughty Dog. Without further ado, here we go. Hello. So this is going to be a familiar scene to anybody who's been following <laughs> Last of Us, right? Yeah, this is one of the first cinematics we put out there to kind of show people the game. Uh, and incidentally, it's w uh, the first cinematic we shot with uh, Ashley Johnson and Troy Baker, who play Ellie and Joel. Easy! Please! Oh, 
Shit. Are we gonna help him? Put your seatbelt on, Ellie. Well, wh what about the guy? He ain't even hurt. <laughs> So where are Joel and Ellie right now? Uh, they've just entered Pittsburgh, which has turned into a giant trap where these people are hunters uh, who kill other survivors in order to steal their supplies. So you're about to see these people want them dead. And one of the things that was important for us is that everybody's life is at jeopardy here. So you're about to see Ellie is going to get choked out by this guy, and it's up to you as a player to save her during this instance. each other at this point in the game? At this point, I, I think it's been a, a couple of days, actually. Uh, and the way you see this will play out, uh, it can play out in very different ways. Uh, and in fact, the supplies Bruce uh, has on him uh, carries over from the previous sections of the game. So depending on how much you've scavenged, how much you've looked for stuff previously, uh, changes how you would approach this setup. So you've got a better chance of survival if you keep your eyes open for things you can use. Yeah, or if uh, you kind of engage with stealth and try to uh, take, uh, take out these guys uh, quietly. They seem to really know where you are. Yeah, so this is using our whole new AI system that we've built for The Last of Us from the ground up. We really wanted, especially for the human antagonism, to coordinate, to surprise you, to think like human beings, and that you should feel like you're playing against um, essentially other people. And here, right there, you, could, you heard them, they're searching for you, so they've lost line of sight. Uh, so you can constantly kind of dip in and out of stealth as you're fighting these guys. What was that that just happened there? So Bruce uh, used a little bit of uh, what we call listen mode, which lets Joel kind of focus his hearing. And he did a takedown. So you could uh, pick up bricks and bottles and throw them at guys to stun them momentarily. Oh and then you can rush them uh, and either take them hostage or, as Bruce did, just try to take them out. <laughs> And you see the whole time Ellie's acting dynamically as well, so. Ouch. Yeah, as, as you're trying to stuff, and as you're, whatever you're doing, Ellie's kind of following suit. And that's Bruce Straley, game director of The Last of Us. Run it again, Bruce. <laughs> it's cool. You can just die in your own game. That's fine. What could he have done better there, Neil? <laughs> uh, he could, uh, there's just different strategies he can apply. Uh, running out in the open like that is probably not the smartest thing he could have done. I'll search out here. Go check the alley. So you can hear that a lot of the dynamic speech is they're going to call out specific areas where they think you are. And actually, each one of the uh, AI and the NPCs have a certain memory. So they remember where they've searched, and they're going to communicate that to one another. So they can remember where you last were. Yes, and they know where you weren't. As they're going around from the alley to the store, um, they know where you haven't been. You got this, Bruce. <laughs> I believe in you. Oh, you son of a whore! Get 
Get your hands off! Get this dude! <laughs> So you hear again the other NPCs reacting to you having taken one of them hostage. It was important to us to humanize these guys and show that they really care for one another. Yeah, that's, that's dynamic because Ellie hit a guy with a bottle earlier. She tells you that um, and she knows when you've lost the guys and when it's the right time to tell. I'm going to find you. No! <laughs> All right. I think that's the last of them. Wait. You okay? Yeah. 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 Good. Great job, Get Bruce. You know the drill, look around, see if there's anything we can use. So that's it, right after, after combat, it's time to look around? Yeah, it's time to search for supplies. And again, that fight could have, he could have stealthed that whole thing and taken guys out quietly without shooting a single bullet. Is that uh, way harder? Uh, in some, it depends on the setup. Some setups are much more difficult to stealth through. Uh, and then, like the next few setups in Pittsburgh that you run into hunters, you could actually skip those altogether. You could stealth around the guys uh, and leave the area without, without firing a single bullet. You can see he just found some parts where when he gets to a workbench, um, he can upgrade his weapons. And all the weapons have different types of upgrades for them. What you find and uh, how you craft it, as we're about to see, that does have an imp like a considerable impact on how the game is played, right? Yeah, and depending, uh, right, he could craft uh, health kits, which you saw he was using dynamically in a fight. So at no point during the crafting or the upgrades or anything does the game pause. It's all happening live. And the idea was to try to man maintain the tension. So as you think you're approach approaching the next setup, you're kind of trying to assess what the threat is going to be uh, and accordingly craft what you think you're going to need for that fight. Or if you think during that fight you found kind of a quiet spot and you've lost the guys, um, you could craft stuff there on the fly, but there's always the risk of them finding you as you're crafting the, the object. And that's where Ellie comes into play, because as guys are rushing you, she's going to call them out, whether they're in front of you or behind you. Or if she has a brick or a bottle, she's going to throw them hey, at them. Maybe we can go through here. Thanks, Ellie. We're seeing these uh, beautiful go. urban environments at the moment. See if you can get but there's, there's more to it, so. isn't there? Like, uh, there's, there's, there's outside, for instance. I know Ellie reacts when she sees Ellie. nature, right? Yeah, uh, the, the game takes place over the course of an entire year. And over that span of time, you're going from you know, the wild wood, woodlands area to cities to small town and a bunch of other stuff we haven't shown. But the game changes quite a bit over the entire course of it. And here you're about to see one of the optional conversations that the player can engage with Ellie. Fucking hunters. See this kid up there in us. Man, that is a lot of people that didn't make it. I knew I should have turned the damn truck around. We lived. Barely. Come on, let's get out of here. Now, the game is littered with these kind of conversations where you hear Ellie and Joel reacting to the environment. How did um, you know? Know what? About the ambush. I've been on both sides. Okay. So, uh, I take that as a yes. I guess this is where the assholes sleep. I mean, slept. So Ellie's behavior here is all dynamic, where she stops, where she looks around. Sometimes she'll find supplies and give it to Joel. Um, but there's a lot of systems in place uh, for Ellie's AI, both in and out of combat.
So it seems you can find some already crafted fully formed supplies. And yeah, and, and everything we're trying to tie to the narrative. So here, because the hunters live in this camp, you find some stuff that they've already crafted and uh, that they use. Uh, and here, as we walk outside, you see Ellie. Um, she's going to spot the pile of bodies and react to oh, it. I don't think these guys were infected. Well, it don't matter. Let's just keep moving. And these things are littered, again, all over the place. Some are on the main path and some are on side paths to let you have all these additional conversations between Joel and Ellie. All right. Here's the bridge. That's our way out of here. Hey, Ellie, slow down. Wait for me. What? Right here. How about you let me go first and keep your voice down? Okay. <laughs> And that's the demo we're going to show today. Well, there we go. That was our um, helping of live Last of Us gameplay. If you're here in the room with us, please stay put. We've got a live Q&A happening in just a few minutes. If you're watching at home, it's time to check in with uh, Dan and Holly. Oh my god, it looks so good! It's pretty special, doesn't it? Now, if you picked up a copy of God of War Ascension, then uh, you've only got one week to wait now until you can actually download a demo that's very different to the one that you've just seen uh, from the PlayStation Store. Obviously, the fact that it's a week away means that you've also got a week to pick up a copy of God of War Ascension. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure if you enjoy shooting up fungus-infected nasties in The Last of Us, you'll probably enjoy ripping the heads off mythical creatures in God of War as well. So. Yeah, what an entirely logical and not at all disturbing conclusion to reach, Holly. Thank you for that. Now. Game are also hosting their biggest lock-in yet at stores across the country. Basically, if you want to get your hands on a completely different demo, this is one that you can't download if you've got Ascension. It's completely different to the one that you've just seen there. Follow at Game Digital on Twitter, and they're about to post a list of all the participating stores. Yeah, now we are minutes away from the live Q&A. Remember, you still have time to get those questions in. You can tweet either at Game Digital, at IGN UK, or at PS Access with your question. But if you don't use the hashtag, they don't get included. And the hashtag is hashtag The Last of Us Live. Yeah, and you've got to be quick because you've got as long as this next trailer to get your questions in. Here. This make you all nostalgic? You know, that is actually before my time. <laughs> that is a winner, though. The roses have faded, there's frost at my door. The birds in the morning don't sing anymore. The grass in the valley is starting to die. And out in the darkness, the whippoorwills cry. The darkness is falling, the sky has turned gray. The hound in the distance is starting to bay. I wonder, I wonder what she's thinking of, forsaken, forgotten, without any love. Alone and forsaken by fate and by man Oh Lord, if you hear me, please hold my hand Alone and forsaken by fate and by man Oh Lord, if you hear me, please hold my hand Oh please understand How did you know? Know what? About the ambush I've been on both sides. Oh. Welcome back. We're here for the live Q&A with uh, our lovely guest from Naughty Dog and Beyond. We've got Neil Druckmann, who is the creative director. We've got Bruce Straley, who just saw play the game, who is the game director. And we have Ashley Johnson, who plays Ellie. So we're going to be, um, yay, to so these people. All right. So we're going to be answering your questions. Uh, hopefully you've been sending them in. If you want to send any during the Q&A, uh, whether you're on the floor or at home, just use the hashtag Last of Us Live. Um, so I'm going to kick off by asking my own question. The tone of The Last of Us is, it's, it's 
dark. You know, it's, it's apocalyptic, it's, it's depressing, it's a sad game to play, and it's a scary game to play. I mean, you guys have been working on this for, what, three and a half years now? Has that kind of affected your mental well-being, <laughs> being, being in this world for so long? Uh, you get exposed to some pretty dark stuff when you do Google image searches, safe search off, and search for diseases or different kind of puncture wounds. Um, <laughs> that's not for the last of us, that's, that's just recreational. That's work. just my <laughs> private folder on the, on the network. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's, it's darker, but you know, you, you get used to it and you try to just focus on what the story needs and um, just do your best from that. I don't know, what do you think, Bruce? Uh, dark. Uh, I don't know. It's also uh, without the darkness, you don't have the light. Like the little moments that you have with Ellie and the little jokes. I mean, you can you can see even in the playthrough, like there's these little moments that, it, despite getting attacked by these ambushers who are basically going to kill you for your shoes, you know, Ellie's kind of a badass and making some jokes and kind of keeping it a little light. She is sort of the light in this dark world. Mm. And Ashley, you had to shoot some. Some moments that were pretty dark that left you <laughs> scarred. Yeah, pretty literally. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, we had there. There's one sequence in particular in the game um, that I remember. After we shot it, I was kind of a little bit in a wreck about it for about a week after. Um, and I mean, most of the time at work, uh, you know, if the end didn't, the day didn't end in bruises. Um, then I didn't do my job. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the second question I'd like to ask personally is, uh, game development, it all comes together very near the end, doesn't it? Was there a time for, for you guys where you knew this was going to be good, where it, where it clicked? Like a, day, like a day before. I would like the second like, yeah, like, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like two minutes, three seconds, and <laughs> like before we actually went gold. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, it's iterations, and you, you're not quite sure. There's a lot of times where there was a, some self And Neil had to deal with me at lunch, I don't know how many times, during the development of this pro project, where I'm just like, you know, I don't know, man, I don't know. I don't know, how are we going to do this? Like, what the fuck, can we back out? Like, I don't... <laughs> You know, let's change it. Let's make a cartoon game with like boxes that fit into you know <laughs> little slots or something. Make it easier on ourselves. But it, you know, ultimately, um, you get these moments like E3. You know, there's like some some snapshots that you're just like, oh, this is gonna be really really great. You know, when we first started kicking around the idea um, three and a half years ago, you're playing the game in your head and you know that this is something you haven't played before. And you know this is something special, and you know as a gamer you want to play this game. So you really just have to kind of hang on to that vision and say, all right, if, if we have to back all the way back out to this higher level and go like, okay, what's going wrong, and what, how do we retain that tone? What do we do, have to do to get that feeling back? Because uh, implementation's not quite working out, and you just have to, like a scientist, just iterate and iterate and iterate. Yeah, and the hard thing with this one has been because it's so systemic, and like the AI system, you know, the production has been three and a half years. The AI system took us three and a half years to write. Uh, things didn't come together until the very end. And you just have to, you know, it's, it's broken for a really long time. You're playing setups and just AI isn't working. Ellie isn't doing what you're thinking she should do. And, you know, you ask yourself this question, like, should we rethink this? Is this ever going to come together? And we were, you know, very fortunate. We work with some of the most talented people in the industry, uh, easily some of the smartest programmers. Um, and then when it all started coming together and everything started gelling and the music was there and the performances were there, all of a sudden we knew as a, as a collective, like we have something really special in our hands. Cool. I guess we'd go straight to some questions from watchers. Uh, so firstly, a question to IGN UK from Joel Nocti89. He asks, why did you believe Troy Baker was the best fit for the character Joel? Start with Neil. He's really handsome. <laughs> have you seen Troy Baker? <laughs> Uh, actually, Joel took us a really long time to find. We had um, a whole casting session where we do about a dozen to do two dozen people. And usually we find our character within that one session. Uh, but with, Tr with Joel, we went through that whole session. Uh, we found Ellie pretty easily. As soon as Ashley walked in, we knew that that was our Ellie. Uh, but we didn't find our Troy on our first round, so we decided to do a whole new round, bring a whole new like group of people. Uh, and this time we had Ashley come in on the audition to see how we can find that chemistry because the relationship between these two characters was the most important thing for the game. Uh, and then uh, Troy walks in and he, if you've ever seen Troy, he looks nothing like Joel. Uh, here's this really kind of, he looks young and he's handsome and he's not that rugged. Uh, <laughs> 
Joel's a bit handsome. Joel's a bit, I guess because Joel has, has a bit of that quality. Um, and right away he had a rapport with Ashley, so that, that, was, a, a, that was okay, maybe this, there's something here. And then when he did the scene, you know, you're just looking for someone to be natural. Uh, and he was natural, uh, we, when we do auditions, there's two kind of scenes that we do. One is very expositional, very dry, to see kind of what the actor can bring to that. Is there any sort of energy to just like you're intrigued you're, to watch them? Uh, and then the other scene is pretty dramatic, um, just to see how far they can carry those emotions and how much they, they, the, the actors can play off each other. And uh, uh, Troy, just like when we watched Ashley, it was just, he was naturally Joel. He naturally brought interesting things that we didn't think of to the character. Ashley, and we didn't know he was a big deal. We didn't know he's in every <laughs> game. Uh, <laughs> Ashley, what did, what did you think? What, what makes him right for, for Joel? Yeah, we went through a couple sessions uh, that they brought me in to read against the different Joels. And it was pretty interesting. <laughs> I think I got in a fight with a couple of the guys and <laughs> didn't end very well. Um, <laughs> but then, yeah, Troy came in and he just, he, he read it completely different than than everybody else. And I mean, he, he fit my idea of who Joel was. I know that wasn't as important as their idea, <laughs> but he was, he was perfect. And we did sort of automatically have chemistry with each other and that's pretty important uh, for the game. Cool, uh, the next question I'm gonna direct at Bruce. And um, this is from Dobbins Designs to IGN UK. He asks, would you consider The Last of Us to now be a franchise? And if so, will its story continue through other mediums? Oh, well, the comic book is already out. So there's a medium right there, and it's awesome. Um, yeah, it's a franchise, I suppose. I mean, we put the blinders on, and we just need to make this game, make it the best that we possibly can, and go on vacation. And that's kind of as far as this has gone right now. Is, is, um, but, you know, this is a, a rich world and amazing characters, and, you know, there's still a lot left to be told. We'll see. Cool. Neil, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, the thing that Bruce and I and the thing that we kind of always discuss with the team is this story, this experience has to stand on its own. Uh, Joel and Ellie go on this very specific journey, and that journey ends with The Last of Us. Um, and then, you know, uh, it is a rich world, and there are these all these characters that we're still intrigued by and with their stories, but... The team's worked very hard, you know, they've been crunching their ass off for six months and now everybody needs to take a break, kind of get their mind off of this. And when we come back, you know, we'll brainstorm some ideas, see if there's something else we want to say with this world. Uh, and if there isn't, we'll go on to something else. Next question was uh, tweeted to PS Access from Solid Panic. Solid Panic asks, uh, did you guys ever consider reversing the roles for the main characters, i.e. having Joel be a woman and Ellie a teenage boy? We did initially, remember, there was, we had like a brainstorm session with the other team, and we're kind of discussing the gender of the roles. Um, uh, but no, I, I guess we've settled on those roles pretty early on, but uh, I've said this before when someone asks a question, like, they don't have to be those genders. Uh, Joel could have been a woman, and Ellie could have been a boy, and the story would still be pretty much the same. Maybe there's a couple scenes that have something specific with their gender, but for the most part, um, the story could have been told that way. Cool. Ash Ashley, have you, what, what do you think that game would be like? Did would it be any different? <laughs> Could you play a boy? <laughs> <laughs> probably. I'm probably closer to a boy than I am a girl anyway. Or not really. That sounds weird. Um, <laughs> I would still play it if that were the case, if you guys decided to somehow change it in the next couple weeks. <laughs> yeah, probably that won't. really would be last minute. <laughs> we'll get right on that. Uh, another question to IGN UK from Matty Aroni 2012 who asks, um, what was it like for Naughty Dog going from adventure, Uncharted series, to horror in The Last of Us? I'll throw that to Neil first, if that's all right. Uh, I get that question. <laughs> uh, in some ways, it's, it's very similar because our process, you know, at Naughty Dog, we make kind of a, a certain kind of game that's very narrative focused, it's very character driven. Um, but, you know, with Uncharted, we felt like, you know, we really kind of owned action adventure. Um, and we wanted to give ourselves a new challenge. And, you know, Bruce and I, when we were first kind of tasked with the idea of doing a new IP for Naughty Dog, um, we're big fans of the survival genre. And we felt, you know, it was kind of lacking in character. Uh, the, 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 this world, this genre really affords you the opportunity to tell a very character driven story because so much pressure is applied on the characters to make really difficult choices. 
Um, so I guess on, on one way it was a lot of fun because you get to explore all these new ideas that you have, but in a lot of ways that I'm sure Bruce can talk to, it's really scary. It's really scary doing a new IP because there's so many unknowns. You don't know who these characters are. You don't know the arcs and the journey you're gonna go on. You don't know your mechanics. There's so many unknowns that for a long time you don't know and you're just kind of stumbling in the, in the dark trying to find them. Um, that was probably the hardest part. It's scary. I mean, Uncharted 2 is an amazing franchise. I mean, it's absolutely like, it now dominates action adventure. And when we were asked to create a new IP for Naughty Dog, like Naughty Dog, you know, and you're trying to take all the information that you've gained over in your experience and everything that you've collected over the years and creating games, and, and then you want to try to do something different and make a mark and try to make something that you as a gamer would want to play and that you as a creator wants to be proud of. And so there's a lot of personal pressure, you know, being applied there. And of course, there's the fans who love Naughty Dog and have expectations. So of course, all these things are external and you, you really try to strip all that stuff away and stay true to what do you want to play? What's the game that you really want to play? And as we started kicking around more and more ideas, it really came down to like, screw Uncharted. I mean, a lot of times we had to just kind of like, you know, uh, the chant the motto, like, it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It, and so then. <laughs> I thought the motto right. was going to be screw Uncharted, screw Uncharted, screw Uncharted. No, <laughs> no, it's like, that's the thing. It's like, it's such a great game. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's just a challenge to try to let go of all of that external stuff and, and just try to stay as true as possible to the vision and kind of what your heart wants, like, to feel when you're playing the game. It's hard. Cool, another question for Ashley. This is from, uh, to PS Access from Jasmur97. He asks, do you feel as though your character is relatable to a wider audience? Wide audience. Uh, interesting. Um, I hope so. Um, I, I think that as for females in video games, not to m make this a bigger discussion than it needs to be, but um, I feel like she is more of your typical 14-year-old teenager than you would see in a normal video game. I mean, it's like most females in video games are, you know, kind of there to be a love interest or there to be just, you know, the token female in the game. Or to be saved. What's that? Or to be saved. Or to be saved. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like, you know, as a female in a video game, she's much more relatable than I think a, a lot of characters are. But, you know, Naughty Dog kind of does that with their females. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, yeah, hopefully that answers that question. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. I have another question to um, PlayStation Access from Mick LSP. He asks, um, this is for Bruce, I think. With PlayStation 4 inbound, did you feel under pressure to make this game the PS3's swan song? And do you think you succeeded? A <laughs> swan song? I, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> there, there, was never, there was never that thought. It, it was really, we always knew from the beginning it was going to be a PS3 game. We, we never considered it being a next-gen title ever. Um, the, the advantage was that you already had the Uncharted engine. So because, you know, we were, we were asked to basically build a second team at Naughty Dog and... Um, you know, there's a lot of skilled people, amazing people who want to flex their muscles um, and have an opportunity to grow under the roof of Naughty Dog. So the second team afforded that. And, um, and yeah, it was the Uncharted Engine was kind of laid the groundwork. 70% of, you know, the tech is already there. AI had to be rewritten because this world, the kind of, tone and the way we wanted the enemies to behave and coordinate and and kind of become alive and become more humanistic um, that had to change that was a big endeavor and um, and then rendering we did a few rendering tweaks here and there the lighting engine had a, another turn of the crank um, but ultimately we had a lot of the groundwork done and it was to our advantage to have uncharted already you know, you know, laying out that foundation to be able to say, okay, we can build upon this. And, and I mean, if we went to next gen immediately, creating a new IP with a new engine, transferring everything over into next gen, it just would have been a super, it was already a hard enough task mm -hmm. as it is. So it was good we stayed on PS3, I think. Yeah. Neil, any thoughts? 
Uh, no, I, I mean, not everything Bruce said is, is there. It's just obviously we came upon some limitations and we had to get really creative with how we handle memory and rendering. Uh, but again, we're lucky that we work with super talented people. I mean, we've never divided up our levels into such tiny chunks so we could, you know, there's no loading screens once you start the, the adventure. Um, and to do that in this game has been really hard because the layouts are much wider uh, and the detail is more intricate than we've ever done. Uh, but again, it was a challenge that we eventually surpassed. It was surpassing in the last second, like everything else, but we did it. Excellent. Next question is to, oh, it's to IGN UK and it is from Robert Rustam, he asks, uh, is there a possibility of any campaign orientated DLC in the future? Yes. yes. Like, like single player story based I DLC? I believe that means story DLC, yeah. We'll see. <laughs> Good, uh, excellent. <laughs> I was, wouldn't say I wasn't expecting that. Uh, question to IGN UK from Envilette. Uh, is the other half of. <laughs> They're not going to answer this, dude. Is the other half of Naughty Dog working on Uncharted 4 for PS4? <laughs> Bruce, Bruce, you got this one. No, we'll they're working see. on Crash Bandicoot for PS4. <laughs> they're working on Crash Bandicoot for PS4. That's what's happening. <laughs> Next question is to the IGN UK team from Fletcher 400. Uh, sorry, to you guys. Uh, tweeted to IGN UK from Fletcher 400, and he asks, To me. Music is a huge part of any game. Who is composing the score for The Last of Us, and will it be as emotional as I hope it to be? Uh, yes, and uh, our composer is Gustavo Santaolalla, um, who's a two-time Academy Award winner for Babel and Brokeback Mountain. Uh, yeah, when Bruce and I was, were first working on the concept for this game, um, you know, we had all these folders together with like images that have been inspiring to us, uh, and there was a music folder that we kind of throw music in there that kind of had the tone for the game. Uh, and we were looking for a composer. We would looked to a bunch of other uh, video game composers for a while. And then we like turned back to our folder and we saw that over half of it was Gustavo's music from different soundtracks that we really liked. And we reached out to our Sony music guys who were helping us look for a composer. And we're like, why don't we contact Gustavo? Mm. Uh, and they're like, yeah, sure. Let's see if we can get a meeting with him. Uh, and pretty soon after, within a week or two, Gustavo agreed to come into Naughty Dog. We presented him, um, kind of, we, we had this pitch that we were working on of that, that shows like the whole game, the mechanics we're after, the arcs of the characters, Here, here's what we're trying to say with this game. Uh, and you know, we're supposed to like meet with him, have lunch, and then the idea is that it'd be an ongoing conversation, whether he'd be interested in it or not. And we came out of that meeting and before we even went for lunch, he's like, yeah, I wanna be part of this. It doesn't matter money, whatever, we'll work all that out. I want to be part of this. Uh, and we were just kind of blown away that like, we got the person we wanted, the ideal person to compose the music for us. Yeah, he's absolutely amazing. And it's so cool to see somebody with, I mean, he has so much heart. And so it's the, the sounds that he gets are just so rich. And yes, it's going to be, uh, the, the music just pulls at, I mean, there's scenes there's scenes in the game, scenes meaning like moments in gameplay and moments in cutscenes, moments that just happen, where, you know, I've played those sequences. I know that everything, all the beats line up, like the, the characters are saying what they're supposed to, when they're supposed to, the, the joystick is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Everything is in, in alignment and it just doesn't quite feel right. And then Neil would work with the Sony Music guys and select, you know, some pieces from Gustavo and and slide it in there. And then, you know, I don't know necessarily, it, it's a huge team, huge project, a lot of things are going on. You can't be in charge or be in touch with everything that's going on. And then I play the game again, and that same exact sequence that wasn't quite working suddenly is like, you know, my heart is pumping or I'm getting a little choked up or something. You know, these moments that happen and that music brings that extra dimension that as only music can. And Gustavo does such a fantastic job, and it's so nice to have somebody that came in and had so much commitment to the story and these characters and what we were trying to do with the experience. It was, it's an awesome experience to work with him. The, the, the other cool thing that was really cool with, with Gustavo is we brought him on so early that he wrote a lot of the music before parts of the game were even done. So we found that you know, we would listen to the music and it would inspire a lot of the story. And even some of the writing, you could say, well, we could do this whole scene without a word of dialogue. And just the music is gonna carry that emotion as, and because it's a theme we've used somewhere else in the story, it's gonna create this emotional connection without having to have so much exposition. And, it, and I found that it made the story that much stronger because of it. 
Cool, I'm going to ask this question to Ashley, because I know this is your favorite subject. Um, to PS Access from Max Longhurst, he asks, who wore the mocap suits uh, for the infected? The staggered writhing movements are really creepy. Oh, who wore the, the, who mo wore the mocap, suits mocap suits for the infected? Yeah. Um, I did one of the infected, actually. <laughs> but I think that was the commercial for back in the day. And I was like, this is awesome. You know. Um, but I, Ruben did a lot of them, right? Ruben did most of them. I Ruben Langdon. It, uh, it was Ruben and me. I, you did so? Yeah. I'm, no way. I'm the clicker. It's yeah. Ruben, Ruben and myself. But the movement was creepy even in person when someone, um, I was mostly there when, when Ruben would, would, was one of the infected. And uh, it was, yeah, <laughs> mostly Ruben and Bruce, I guess. Yeah, there's a, there's a behind the scenes video of Bruce walking around the office like a clicker uh, that we should put out there. <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> I think we have time for one last question. Um, this is a question to PS Access from Ravis Wins 23 He asks, is there as strong an emphasis on stealth and strategy in the multiplayer as there is in the single player? Neil. Mm. Slash Bruce. Bruce. Uh, you know, we haven't really said anything about multiplayer, but we will say it's fun to play around the office. And we tried really hard, and we think we succeeded to retain the same tone, tension, sort of weight that the single player um, moments have. So uh, we're really proud of, of that and looking forward to talk more soon. In which case, we probably have time for one more question, uh, which I'm going to pick. I'm going to pick. I'm going to pick. Uh, yeah. This is 2IJN UK from Chubaza. He asks, in the trailer, Joel approaches a beaten and begging foe. Will game enemies surrender? And if so, can we decide their fate? I don't know who wants to answer I, that. I actually wouldn't. <laughs> uh, the question was whether uh, people will beg for their lives. Uh, they will. Um, and whether you can choose what to do then. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this, this, the, this stuff, the, the hunters, um, it can dynamically happen. It's actually pretty rare, but it does happen. Uh, and they're out to kill you, they're out to survive. So I I for a while we had the, the, the choice in there, but um, we ended up taking it out. So you kind of have to kill them. And, and there's a reason we did that. And we're, again, we're trying to show with Joel that you're kind of forced into these situations that you constantly have to cross this moral line, that you're not playing the good guy in, in these situations. Yeah, the, 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 the enemies will, there, there are points where you can get the bed, beg sequence to happen. Um, ultimately though, yeah, I'm not, I don't want to give it away because it's kind of a surprise on how it plays out, but, um, and let the, let the players experience that. But the other thing is you can, you can choose, in a lot of the scenarios inside of the game, you can choose to go about it um, full combat based on what you found in the environment, how you've crafted, your choices in what you've crafted, uh, how much ammo you've, you've accrued, and you can say, I want to just go in straight in combat. Uh, or I can craft some shivs and some things that are more like stealth oriented and try to go more stealth takedowns. And then a lot of the setups in the game, you can choose to just try to get around the enemies without engaging at all. Uh, so it, it's really trying to, one, as gamers, just have a fun time. But really, it's, it's, it's trying to put you in Joel and Ellie's position and say, like, OK, if you are a survivor inside of here, if you know your life was in jeopardy, if Ellie and Joel's lives are in jeopardy, then do you need to engage? How would you engage? And then how do you, and it's really to get you mentally more into the space and into the shoes of them so you can be right there making the tough choices and the decisions that they have to all the time. And so it's really more about the choices that we give in combat than like these specific exact moments. Great, so I think that's all we have time for. Uh, so I'd just like to say thank you very, very much to Bruce, Neil, and Ashley. Cool. So if you've been joining us on the live stream, thank you very, very much. If you're in the room, stick around for a second. But otherwise, it's time to head back to Dan and Holly. And that's almost it. There's just enough time to say thank you to the guys at Naughty Dog, Ashley and Keza, and of course, you for all your contributions and comments. Well, except for you. Yeah, we've been reading them. Yeah, even the nasty ones. 
Cheers, guys. Anyway, uh, on another note, uh, we'll combine The Last of Us will be out on June 14th, and you can pre-order it now from game. If you are lucky enough to have the God of War Ascension game, the demo will be available to you on the 31st of May. We're also really excited to announce that from tomorrow onwards, you'll be able to get a completely brand new limited edition, completely exclusive and available from game. So you can head to their website tomorrow to find more information, or you can follow at Game Digital now, because I'm pretty sure the social team are on standby and already sending some tweets. Be there as we speak. And if you came to this late, or you fancy watching the whole thing again, and to be honest, I don't blame you, it'll be available straight after this. All that's left for me to say is on behalf of Access, IGN, and Game, thank you so much for watching, and have a great night. What if it's true? Do I need to remind you what is out there? Once upon a time, I had somebody that I cared about. And in this world, that sort of shit's good for one thing. Getting you killed. I need something smuggled out of the city. Just cargo, Joel. I just want some simple gear, enough to set me on my way. I reckon it's got something to do with that girl. It's got everything to do with that little girl. It can't be any worse than in here. Can it? We're shitty people, Joel. It's been that way for a long time. No, we are survivors. This is our chance. It is over, Tess! What are you so afraid of? You're treading on some mighty thin ice here. What do we do? You make every shot count. <laughs> See, I believe everything happens for a reason. We don't have to do this. You know that, right? After all we've been through, everything that I've done, it can't be for nothing.